Good morning and welcome to the University United Methodist Church and welcome to the Sunday message. We're having to pre-record this today for the internet is not cooperating with us. So please bear with us. I'd like to welcome all of our veterans who are viewing this today as this is Veterans Day Sunday and to take a moment and say thank you for all your sacrifice and the work that you have done for the nation and also for the churches as you help guarantee our right to come together to worship. In our church, like most churches, there are two flags. There's the American flag and also the Christian flag. Both of these flags represent two forms of freedom. The American flag, it represents within our lives the ability to speak, the ability to live where we want to live, the ability to dream dreams and fulfill those dreams. Whereas the Christian flag guarantees us a freedom from sin, a freedom from the darkness of this world and a freedom to be able to turn to God in any circumstance to be able to give him thanks and praise. But in both of these freedoms, we find the word veteran. When we think about a veteran, it's one who enlisted to serve. The one I think of in the Christian faith is Paul. Because you see, on his way to Damascus to actually persecute the Christians, he had a confrontation with Jesus, and Jesus recruited him. At that particular point, he basically became one of God's army. And when we look at this, we see that Paul, not only being the Pharisee of Pharisees, became the veterans of veterans. He sat in many hard, harsh hardships. And if you think for a moment, he was flogged for what he believed. He was spit on for what he believed. And all these things, he finally got thrown in prison more than once. But in his final time, he was in prison. All he had was a pen and a quill to be able to write down what he had thought. And so he wrote a letter knowing he was fixing to be executed to a young minister by the name of Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, Paul makes this brief statement. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Veterans over the centuries have sacrificed to obtain and preserve this precious freedom, which also includes the God-given right to worship our Creator anytime, anywhere. That leads us to the other type of freedom represented by the Christian flag, a greater freedom that can only be found in Christ, who died as a ransom to set us free, and this freedom from a life of fertility, freedom from sin, regret, hate, bitterness, it's the freedom to love God and to love your neighbor. And these two short verses in Timothy, Paul gives us four words, to enlist, to endure, to engage, and entangle, each representing a different aspect of what it takes to be a soldier of Christ and a follower of Christ. The first one is that of enlist. Though the word is not stated that way, we note that there must be an enlistment because it says that we want to please the one who enlisted us. So we had to look forward to that. You can't be a veteran of anything unless you enlist. And as Paul says in that transition, a soldier wants to please the one who recruited him. You know, I sit back, though, as a veteran, and I go back to the days of my recruitment. And I sit at times, and I think about that, and though I don't remember my recruiter's name, I remember the visit to his office, and we sat down, and I was juggling between college and what to do with my life. And he showed me those wonderful movies. He showed me the infantry. He showed me the armor. He showed me the artillery, and he looked at me and he says, Tom, in looking at what you like, because you like to run and you like to be outdoors, you need to be in the infantry. And I sat back and thought, being an army brat also, 
no, I really don't want to spend my life in the mud and in the cold out in the middle of the field. So I said, no, that, that's really not what I want. And he looked for a moment and he came back and says, Tom, armor. Armor's where you need to be. To be able to get in one of those tanks and to fire and to drive all that. And I looked at him and I thought, no, my dad was an armor officer and I remember he was never home. He always complained about how cold the tanks were in the winter, how hot they were during the summer. And I said, no, armor's not it either. So he looked at me and he says, artillery. Artillery's where you need to be. And I thought about that for a moment. And I thought, hmm, you load a cannon, you fire it, it shoots 30 rounds downrange. And if you're shooting something 30 miles downrange, it means that you're 30 miles from the front line. And I thought, you know, that doesn't sound bad. It was only later in looking through my paperwork, what he never told me is that I qualified to become an officer as well. But in all my reflection, I'm glad that didn't happen because I would never trade the days of my enlistment and being an NCO. And it helped me when I finally did become an officer. You see, there's tough decisions that we have to make. When a person enlists, especially young people who talk to me, they come to me because they're looking for a way to get into college or get through college. They're looking for a way to fulfill a patriotic duty or sense within themselves. They may have been raised in the military and it's what they know and they want to stay with it. But they're looking for some sense or direction in their life. And no matter what the reasons are, it's a tough decision, life-changing, to simply leave everything behind. God does not force anyone to serve in his army either. But he does have recruitment officers. It's you and I. I wonder how many people will ever remember the times that we've tried them to Christ. And when someone says, how did you find Christ? I wonder how many can name us by name, but I can guarantee you a lot of them can see our face within their heart. You see, God doesn't force us to do this. It's a choice. And people make a decisions for different reasons. Maybe you're brought up in the faith by your parents, or maybe you sense God's leading in your life. Or maybe you came to Christ looking for a sense of purpose and direction. No matter what the reason, it's a life-changing decision and not one to be taken lightly. Even Jesus said, whoever is not willing to carry his cross and follow me cannot be my follower. He says you have to leave things behind. You have to look forward. It's your choice. But when you make the choice, you have to stick with it. The other is to endure. No veteran can forget their basic training. All of us look back and sometimes we can say it was the best time we ever had in the military because we were being broken down and we were being strengthened in ways that we didn't even know we had strengths. But when we look back, we laugh today, but there are a lot of hardships during that basic training as well. One of my favorite was that of the gas chamber. I always remember going into the gas chamber and what you do is you're actually checking your equipment and you're learning what it is like and why it's important that your equipment works. But I remember you go in and you pull off your mask and you can't breathe. Your eyes burn. Your nose runs. You can't swallow. All you want to do is gag and get out. But to get out, you have to look at one of the instructors who are there and to be able to give them your name, your rank, and also your serial number, your social security number. And what I remember is that I was told to pull mine off before the other person left. And I was standing there and he was stuttering and slobbering through his. And all I could think of was, please God, let him leave so that I can say what I have to say. And then God, let me remember who I am so that I can tell this instructor and I can leave as well. But in years to come, it wasn't the last time I went through the gas chamber. And I always remember them saying, if you've ever done this, you'll never forget. And I'd raise my hand and I'd say, I haven't forgot, so why should I do it now? And he says, again, to make certain your equipment works. You see, we're preparing for battle. We have to make certain our equipment works, even as Christians. And that means that we have to turn to Christ every day. We have to lift him up. We have to test ourselves to be see where he wants us to be. 
It's a personal pledge that you're going to let Christ become the true leader in your life. And I'm certain that there's many here today who are watching this who are happy that they made the choice that they made. The other is to endure. In that endurance, see, not only in gas chambers, but also we have to remember that endurance means the separation from our families, the hardships that we face, the fears that we had. And all these things, Paul, during his missionary journey, was flogged, stoned, shipwrecked, and more. But in, even in America, life is full of hardships. Bad things happen. Our faith is tested. James reminds us, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. As soldiers of Christ, we have to endure. We have to keep the faith, and we have to praise God even in the midst of our struggles. We also have to be engaged in our faith. General Sherman once said, you don't know the horrible aspect of war. I've been through two wars and I know. I've seen cities and homes in ashes. I've seen thousands of men lying on the ground, their dead faces looking up at the skies. I tell you, war is hell. While I've never experienced the horrible aspect of war, I have great respect for those who've engaged in war. We have to remember that you have to be prepared to meet the enemy. That's what we're being reminded when we're engaged. It's what we have to remember when we sit back and we make certain our equipment is up to par, is that we are going to engage an enemy. In other words, as soldiers of Jesus Christ, we have to be prepared to engage in spiritual warfare. We battle temptation. We stand opposed to false religions and worldviews that are hostile towards Christianity. We are called to defend our faith with reason and precision. And in God's army, we aren't fighting alone. Just as soldiers fight in a squad or platoon or company, we depend on each other. Christians rely on our church families to support us and stand behind us even more we have God on our side. But the final word here is entangled. It's the last word that Paul uses in the two verses. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of this world. I heard about a new recruit shortly after he joined the Navy who asked this officer for a pass so he could attend the wedding. The officer gave him the pass but informed the young man he'd, he had to be back by 7 p.m. on Sunday. You don't understand, sir, said the recruit. I'm in the wedding. No, you don't understand, the officer shot back. You're in the Navy. When you serve the American flag, you're expected to be completely committed to your country and to allow nothing to prevent you from performing your duties and serving faithfully. When you serve the Christian flag, you're also expected to be completely committed to Christ and his kingdom. You are expected to serve him faithfully, not allowing anything to keep you from doing his will. Unfortunately, today, countless Christians, after coming to Christ in faith, do get entangled in the affairs of this world. They don't just let things become more than what they are. What they do is they put these things in front of Christ. And that keeps us from following Christ and putting Christ at our head. As I said before, there are two types of freedom embodied in two flags. We want to say many thanks to the veterans who have served to preserve our political freedom, which allows us to freely worship our Creator, who gives us the greater freedom as we all so desperately need. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for those who served and those who have put their life on line. Thank you for those who gave their all. But we ask that you bless families everywhere. And where soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines are separated, we ask that you help them to keep the vow and the covenant made with their families and the ones that they love until they return safely. We pray this day for our nation and lift it to you that you help us, O oh Lord, as Christians, to finally make a stand, not to sit back like frightened sheep, but to stand up for you and your faith, lest we lose it. But in this day, O oh Lord, we simply give you thanks 
and that's a blessing upon all who are in need. Amen. Go in peace and may God bless you this day.